Our second scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And this translation is from the Common English Bible. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? And Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And after he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, smeared the mud on the man's eyes. And Jesus said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went away and washed. And when he returned, he could see. Um, so we've been talking about miracles for the last few weeks. We have a few more weeks left to talk about miracles. So I wanted to take this opportunity to address an issue that I know we've all been wrestling with. One of these big theological quandaries, one of mankind's most searching questions for the divine. The question is, does God cheer for one football team over another? <laughs> and if so, how does God answer our prayers to, to provide divine intervention and supply a miracle on the field when it is so desperately needed? <laughs> These are the questions we're asking, you guys. But luckily for you, I have a video. I have photographic proof for you to witness with your own eyes a football miracle. I would encourage you all to Google the Minneapolis miracle later, um, just so you could like fully understand. It was January 14th, 2017. It was a playoff game between the Minnesota Vikings and the New Orleans Saints. The score was 24 to 23, and the Saints were ahead by one point. The Vikings had given up a huge lead. The score was 17 to zero Vikings at halftime. And they found themselves at this point. Down by one with 10 seconds on the clock. And the final play started and the announcer, Paul Allen announced, we need a Minneapolis miracle. As a Minnesota sports fan, I cannot even begin to express the emotion of that game and that play to end the game. Um, being a Minnesota sports fan is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> because we are not accustomed to winning. And so when we do, it makes the moment all the more miraculous. The definition of a miracle is less about what the miracle itself was, but more the experience of wonder that was brought about in the moment. Sharon Oliver shared this definition um, of wonder at yoga on Thursday, saying, wonder is a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. The sense of wonder is how we know that something amazing just happened. And being in tune to wonder is how we receive all the miracles that are all around us. Because miracles come from living with wonder. And as a person of faith and a semi-professional faith leader, I firmly believe but I've been called into the business of hope, of sharing hope and embodying hope and reassuring that there is always reason for hope. But as a rule, inherent in my hope-filled outlook, I live with this contradiction that I can be hopeful and also 
overly analytic. Um, sometimes erring on the side of more skeptical in my hopefulness. Sometimes I really need evidence and proof in order to be convinced. And sometimes that plays out in needing to do things for myself and needing to see for myself. And it creates an interesting tension. <laughs> I was, one summer I wore a shirt that said optimist on it, and I always felt the need to qualify it. Like, but I'm like a cautious optimist. <laughs> I'm like a hope-filled skeptic. Um, and I was just thinking how this plays out at home where my family tries to tell me something and I'm like, really? Show me. <laughs> Prove this to me. Because they think they are convinced that there is no milk, they are convinced they have no clean socks, and they are convinced that their keys and wallet have been taken. <laughs> and miraculously, when I look, there is milk. There are clean socks. There are the keys and the wallet. Do these miracles happen in your homes too? <laughs> um, there's just something about seeing the things that are right in front of us. But there's a difference then when we apply a deep trust and hope, which is inherent in our lives of faithful discipleship in order to see what is not so easy to identify. Which is why my analytic brain has been kind of turned on full force as we've been talking about miracles. I was trying so hard to stay connected to what is easy to identify, what is right in front of me, using my rational mind. So I would say things like, that's not a miracle, that's science. That's not a miracle, that's gratitude. Or, that's not a miracle, that's just a hilarious inside joke. That's not a miracle because we put our long hours and we worked hard, we put our blood, sweat into tears into that. That's not a miracle because it has a super logical explanation. And so for someone who lives and breathes this hope and faith, I have to be honest that I've spent a lot of time up in my head thinking about miracles, wondering about the times that I've been really certain about a miracle, and feeling like miracles are either, either an easy answer to something or that miracles require way too much faith. And more often than not, I'm in the messy middle. That's where I find myself, somewhere in between. So today I want to explore less about what constitutes a miracle what the structure or definition is, and more about what the realization of a miracle does for us. Because science is a miracle, and hard work is a miracle, and gratitude is a miracle, and kittens are miracles too. <laughs> that was mine. <laughs> miracles are individual and specific depending on the person and the place and your perspective but it is in the grasping of the moment, in the experience of the emotion of wonder, that I truly believe that the Spirit of God is alive and majestically at work. In Deuteronomy 10, we're reminded again of all that God is and all that God does. He is the God of gods and Lord of lords, mighty and awesome, not partial, cannot be bribed, seeks justice for the orphan and the widow, and loves the stranger. And that's the God who we worship, who we stand in awe of because of the amazing things that God does, things that we have seen with our own eyes, things that we've witnessed, things that we admire and know to be beautiful and, and surprising, things that cause us to experience wonder and awe. Verse 21 says, God is your praise. God is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. And for me, that is less about physically seeing miracles, but more about coming to the realization and awareness that in our awe and wonder, we are praising and worshiping God. 
Andrea Gibson is a local spoken word poet who has a huge TikTok following, and they've won four Grand Slam, Poetry Grand Slam championships. They shared a poem recently that spoke of miracles and wonder, despite being in the midst of cancer treatment and health issues. And so they wrote, I stopped waiting for awe to find me and made it my job to find it. What purpose could I possibly have that is greater than building my goosebump collection? At another point in this poem, they reference that in our lifetime, we should have said, wow, eight million times. And so after listening to Andy's poem, what I reflected on is that when I think about the miracles that I've experienced, I think about what gave me goosebumps? What gave me chills? What surprised and delighted me? What put me in awe? I love the idea that life is a series of experiences that bring us to our knees with curiosity and awe and astonishment. And the more times we experience goosebumps, the better. For that's what God imagines for us in a life that is full and abundant. God delights in our delight and our free-flowing amazement at all the minor and major moments in this journey of life. And the thing that strikes me in my contemplation on miracles is the contrast between the normal every day and the marvelous. To be in tune to miracles, we have to be willing to recognize when we've been in need for help, when we've been in need for intervention, and the times that we've been in patterns of loss or grief. Because life can never be lived only on the mountaintop, which makes the miraculous moments when we are deep in the valley shine all the more brightly. And those who I know who are most in tune to wonder are those who have faced the unimaginable. Those who have sacrificed, those who have climbed back up from despair and destruction, and yet have held on to such a sense of wonder that they can see the miracles when they come. The Quaker writer and educator Parker Palmer has developed a series of tools for a group conversation based on a practice of deep listening. And there's a motto he uses in that work that I've adopted for all aspects of my life because it has never failed me yet. When the going gets tough, he says, turn to wonder. When things are hard, turn to wonder. When I'm all up in my thoughts, turn to wonder. To bring in the curiosity of a child to delight in the simple pleasures, to take a new path home, and to always look for miracles. And I think the way that Jesus models how to turn to wonder is remarkable, and mostly the way that he demands it of his disciples. When they think they have everything figured out, Jesus asks them a question and shows them a sign or a miracle, and it blows their minds, and fills them with wonder and awe. And of all the biblical accounts of miracles and signs and wonders, the healing of the blind man with mud and spit is one of my favorites. I love the tactile nature of it and the visual image of the mud mixing. And even more than that, the important correction that Jesus provides his disciples here is so vital. The assumption is that this man was born with a condition in which he could not see, that he was differently abled. And that must mean that he or his parents had sinned. And Jesus is so quick to shut down this problematic line of questioning, which would have been a common assumption at the time. So Jesus makes clear that this person, this blind man, this beautiful child of God, is in no way less than and that that condition has nothing to do with sin. Instead, Jesus declared that in all circumstances is the opportunity to realize the wonder and glory of God. In all circumstances, the opportunity to realize 
the wonder and glory of God if we are attuned and if we are willing. So I go back to that almost five-year-old video from the Minnesota Vikings regularly. Um, <laughs> it always brings me to tears, not because of any amazing feat of athleticism, not because it was the beginning of a Minnesota championship season and finally winning a Super Bowl, because it was not. <laughs> but I love those moments afterwards, the moments of totally unbridled joy and enthusiasm and astonishment that followed that touchdown. It's in those goosebump moments, those moments of awe and amazement, that we come closer to God. I um, <laughs> just had this one thought that I needed to share. Okay, sorry. Um, so the opposite of wonder is apathy. The opposite of wonder is disengagement and disinterest. And I think what the world needs from us most right now is people of faith, is people who are alive with the wonder of the greatness of God, the way that God is alive and working in our lives, and that that is what we can share with others. So I challenge us all to hold tight to the sense of wonder that you encounter this week. And let that be the experience of God that moves you into your deeper discipleship. Amen.